Hello, everybody, and welcome to No Summary, Golden Threads Online Conversations with Artists Who Don't Fit in a Box. For those of you who don't know Golden Thread, it is the first U.S. theater company devoted to Middle Eastern artists and stories, and was founded by playwright and director Taranj Yegizarian in 1996. Thank you, Taranj. My name is Catherine Corey, she, her, and I am joining from the island of Manhattan, uh, land of the Lenape people, and I would like to take a moment here to acknowledge the people uh, of the land on which Golden Thread is located, uh, the multiple Ohlone tribes. Despite the atrocities of colonization and genocide, Native communities persist today and are active in efforts to preserve and revive their culture. Golden Thread is driven by a desire to expand this land acknowledgement statement communities experience of occupation in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, and the displaced populations. Whether we are immigrants displaced by political or economic events or US born uh, for one or more generations, we all appreciate the human connection to the land. No Summary program is in its fourth season this year. In this new season, the program embarks on a virtual tour to universities across the nation, bringing Golden Threads conversations with artists who don't fit in a box to theater and arts classes. Today, episode two, Mina Playwrights on Storytelling with University of Washington and Cal Poly theater students. This episode of No Summary brings together a panel of Mina Playwrights who are writing powerful stories for US audiences and using their platforms to shed light on the experiences of underrepresented communities. We'll talk about the creative process of playwriting, the challenges and opportunities of bringing diverse stories to the stage and the impact that these stories can have on audiences. Today's panelists, whom I will introduce shortly, are playwrights Yusuf El Gindi, Denmal Ibrahim, and Hadi Tabal. These writers will share their experiences, discuss the significance of storytelling in MENA cultures, and reflect on the ways in which their work has contributed to the broader discourse on race, power, and representation in the United States. Before I introduce the writers and we dive into our conversation, I would like to take a moment to welcome guests who are joining here in the Zoom room, but also those tuning in um, uh, via live stream on HowlRound. Those here with us, please feel free to utilize the chat function uh, to post your comments and questions. And later on, I'll ask everybody to turn on their cameras if they are so inclined. But I'm especially happy to welcome the students of MENA American Theater class at California Polytechnic University, designed and taught by Professor Halabaki, to imagine how MENA theater can contribute to a more inclusive American culture, and a plays and styles drama class at the University of Washington, taught by Mona Merhi, who has focused the course on topics related to race, ethnicity, and identity representation by examining the works of playwrights from the MENA region alongside modern and contemporary Western texts. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our playwright panelists. Youssef El Gindi, born in Egypt, raised in London, and now based in Seattle, Youssef. Youssef's work frequently examines the collision of ethnicities, cultures, and politics that face Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. His plays have been produced at Marin Theater Company, ACT in Seattle, and at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts also at Portland Center Stage. He is the recipient of many honors, including the Steinberg ATCA New Play Award, LA Weekly's Excellence in Playwriting Award, and the Middle East America Distinguished Playwright Award. Adi Tabal is a New York City-based writer and actor who was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. His plays have been presented at Berkeley Rep's Ground Floor Program. He has been a Playwrights Realm semi-finalist and his most recent play, Christina et Maria et Leonis is an artist advancing cultural change commission from the Noor Theater and Pop Culture Collaborative. As an actor, Addy appeared in the Vagrant Trilogy at the Public Theater, English at the Atlantic Theater, winner of an Obie Award and the Lucille Lortel nomination. And on television, he played Amir al raisani on NBC's The Brave. Denmo Ibrahim is an American playwright and actor of Egyptian descent. Her plays have been part of the Bay Area Playwrights Festival produced at the Marin Theater Company and at Golden Thread. Her audio immersive book, Zainab's Night of Destiny, has engaged thousands of elementary and middle school students in Louisville, Kentucky. I really must, I really must experience that demo. 
As an actor, she has appeared at Berkeley Repertory Theater, American Conservatory Theater, The Old Globe, Seattle Rep, Marin Theater Company, and Cal Shakespeare. Benmo is a proud resident artist of Golden Thread and the steering committee member of the MENA Theater Makers Alliance, MENATMA. Welcome, all three of you. I'm so thrilled to be in a room with you, even if it's virtual. And uh, everybody, you are welcome to learn more about these amazing artists from their bios, which are in the chat. Okay. Here we are. I want to ask a few questions. I just want to throw them out to all three of you, okay? And um, get the conversation started before we tap into these uh, Middle Eastern theater classes. I'm so excited to hear what the students would like to know. But first of all, I think it would be great if we could get a little background on you all, right? A little bit of where you came from, how you got started writing. Um, one thing that I'm a little bit curious about if you could tell us more about your background, is I think that all of you at one time and now have been and are actors. And so what interests me, and I'm, the thing I'm curious about, is how, if studying acting and working as a professional actor is one of the things that led you to tell your own stories in plays. So I'm curious about that. And I would like to start with Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi, Catherine. It's so good to see you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I think I used to be afraid of it. Uh, I remember being at Sundance. <laughs> remember the Sundance Theater Program? Um, uh, uh, we, uh, it was maybe uh, 10, 11 years ago. And uh, I remember, you know, like writers would go and, you know, write new pages and come back. And I was like, oh, I can't do that. And then, you know, I think at a certain point, you get a nagging sensation of telling you want to tell something. And then you kind of go, oh, I think I like it. And you kind of get a, a bit of good feedback. And then you say, oh, I think I do want to do this. Um, I think being an actor was uh was the in for me because i was in so many development rooms i've been in readings yusuf's readings and like you know many uh many other um opportunities and so seeing uh i think it, it it was it was it was mind opening to be able to do it after having been on the speaking side of it uh and also uh i do experience the advantages of it uh because you're an actor you kind of you know you can you somehow play them all in your head out loud when, when you write, if that's your process. But also the disadvantages of it, which is, um, I feel like sometimes as writers, we write for our sensibility as as, as actors. Uh, and so sometimes that does stand in the way because there is something that I think writers who don't act do, which is they just put the words and they go, okay, someone will figure it out. And I can never, I can't put myself in a situation where I'm like, oh, someone else will figure it out. I feel like I have to figure it out performance wise. So that kind of gets in the way sometimes. That is really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That is great. Yeah. Denmo, your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, it's a it's a really interesting pathway actor to writer in the MENA space in particular, um, because I think you know you know for our generation um, there were no works, <laughs> so you know I went to conservatory undergrad. Um, you know I started with a class of sixty and graduated with a class of eleven, and then I did graduate work in physical theater, and I had spent and then I studied in Europe, and I you know I'd spent almost a decade crafting, working on the craft, and developing how do you audition and how do you be good in the room and how do you analyze a script, and at the end of the day, your work was always measured by the role you had permission to play. And I think that's just something we don't really talk a lot about in the acting world is, you know, no matter how, <laughs> how established, how much you train, how much you love it, you know, you, you can't act, uh, you can't just invent that unless you decide to invent that. And I think that's where a lot of writers kind of come into the room. You know, I, um, I was getting cast in roles that felt were very limiting to the kinds of experiences, the kinds of stories I wanted to tell. And to be completely honest, I wasn't coming from a place of, I wanna tell Mina stories. No, I was just coming from a place of, I wanna have a full journey on stage. 
And because of the way I look, I wasn't really being cast in the characters that were the most well-written. So I think for me, I was just really longing to play on stage. And so writing felt like this sort of like, you know, stepchild thing of like, I have to have a relationship with writing, but I'm not really a writer. And I had said that for so long, I'm not a writer. And I realized, oh, you know, it took me a long time to realize that writing is thinking and and like good writing is clear thinking. And, and eventually it just becomes about stories. And it was very interesting to see, uh, you know, I, I had been a part of a theater company and it was a devised company. We spent five years developing new work through an ensemble. So it wasn't a personal story, but it was the sort of actor creator world. And when I sort of left that space, I gave myself this challenge of something I had never done, which is write a solo show. I had been in all these ensembles. I had never done a solo work. And my first piece was Baba. And that was a really, um, I think terrifying experience because you know I had set myself up to say I want to do a solo show but about what and I spoke with a mentor and he said you know what's a story you would never want to tell and my face fell and he said whatever that was that's it and it just gave me the chills and and that was really my entry into why playwriting why storytelling and i've really held on to that as a momentum in the writing world wonderful and it's interesting too <clears throat> that you just said that in your graduate program you were in a physical based acting program because when i read baba which i finally did just a week or so ago it it it's so physical. I mean, the physical life of Baba is so um, magical. Mm. And it, it I, now that makes sense that your actor training would have played into your creation of that piece. Definitely. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, Yusuf El-Gindi, um, you yeah. have visited my class and um, you were brilliant and um, they adored you. And, but you, you, you made a surprising comment at one point um, because it's an acting class that I that I put together at the Experimental Theater Wing, to which I invite playwrights um, to inter interact with the students and read their work. They read their work, and you revealed something I did not know, which was you had been an actor. Yes. Can you talk just, a little bit about how you got from one to the other? I just want to clarify the audio you heard while we were waiting to come on. It was because I need my cat fix. It was, look at this little cutie cat. Isn't this, isn't this just the- You want treats? You want my soul? You want my undying loyalty? I'll give you anything. So you think you can just tell your head like- I just, I'm sorry, I need, I thought I need to be inspired before I come to this class and cats just do it to me. It must be the Egyptian, Egyptian in me and the- I think you just, I think you just wish you had written that. Yes. Yes, it'll it'll filter into my uh, work somehow. So I did start off as an actor. Oh, by the way, before I forget, demo. Uh, I've heard many good things. I'm here at Fort Worth at um, uh, at Amphibian Stage, and people say many are saying many good things about Baba. Mm. You know, somebody was saying, oh, they were in tears, and so congratulations on the on the play. Um, so. Um, I did start off as an actor. I wanted to be an actor. I, I've, I think I've told this anecdote many times that, you know, I was uh, uh, passionate about it. I sort of, I, I was more of a poet and I sort of wrote a couple of plays and um, and I, 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 I was going to audition for six acting schools in the States. And, and then I just thought, well, let me as a backup plan uh, also submit something to a, a playwright, uh, something for playwriting. And before I went, I had a tarot card reading that said, you're going to be a writer, 90%, and an actor, 10%. And I said, no, 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 you've got that wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to be a, a, an actor, and then maybe 10%, I'll just write it on the side. And so I went to the, uh, and I auditioned, and I got rejected by all six acting schools, and I got accepted into the writing, playwriting school, you know, uh, and I, I was going, what the hell? I'm, and I felt very, uh, I thought I'm going to be among students who are passionate about writing this graduate level, you know, and, and what do I know about writing? 
And um, so I did continue to act and I continued to act and think of myself as an actor up until my mid thirties. Um, and then for various reasons, I just, you know, stopped the acting. I, I, I made a short film and I thought, well, I'll, I'll go into cinema. And then I, that, uh, I didn't really enjoy that experience. And that kind of left playwriting in my late, late, um, 30s, I just said, well, that's that's all I can do. But acting, sure, acting, I, I think anybody who tests, who goes from acting to writing, that that figures in absolutely into the writing process because, you know, as a, as a, with that experience, um, when I am thinking of, um, when I'm writing, I am thinking, where are my actors on stage? What's happening? What are they touching? What are they seeing? What's going on physically? Uh, have I are they talking because I, I can be a bit wordy so what what are they doing are they uh, you know sometimes people just sit and talk yes but you know what's in their hand so that is that all came and when they go off stage you know have I given them enough time to transition into their so all that is very very useful um it's not the only route into writing um I, I know of several uh uh playwrights who were never actors but it, it has helped me so yeah. and I've noticed uh, you said I noticed uh, in reading your plays how precise and full you are in stage directions about what the physical involvement of the of the actor is in each and every scene. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, let's move on just a little bit to talk about what it maybe a little bit what your experience of being um, a playwright, a storyteller of Middle Eastern origin. Um, you know, I mean, each of you is in a different um, place in terms of your relationship to the United States, right? Um, you said you came here years ago, right? And, 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 and Heather, you came for graduate school and you have decided to stay. And then, well, you were born here, correct? So, we, you know, we're all at, at different places in terms of our our place in the diaspora. And I'm just, you know, wondering for each of you, and we'll start with you, Seth, this time, um, how your storytelling reflects your experience of having migrated and being part of this community. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I, mean, I think as Denmo mentioned that there was a, a, a time <laughs> It was a desert, a wilderness of no representation. I mean, it was quite the absence of representation was quite shocking. It wasn't even the occasional thing that bubbled up. There was nothing. And so when I sent out my stories, I don't think there was even a sort of, there was nothing to register. You know, it's like, why, why are we paying attention to your story? I mean, it's not relevant to anything because nothing in the culture uh, talked about us. And when we were talked about, it was always negatively. So... I grew up very much uh, without that. Um, um, and um, it's only in my 40s. I mean, imagine going through your whole life with no seeing no representation, uh, knowing the things you write will not be done. Um, and thank God for Golden Thread Productions. Because literally, Taranj, I when I finally got on the computer, when I finally got on the, <laughs> yes, Way back in the dinosaur area, I finally got the computer and I plugged it. I finally got on the internet in 1999. I always say 2000 and Taran says, no, it was 1999. And I typed in Arab American theater. And a couple of theaters uh, popped up. Uh, the, uh, I think, I forget, it's called the Arab Theatrical Guild in Dearborn, uh, Dearborn, Michigan and Golden Thread Productions. I wrote to both of them and both of them said, yeah, send me stuff. Uh, I only had one production with, because it really wasn't a, a theater person, but Taranj was like, yes, send me your stuff. And that was, send me more. And really, because as a writer, you have to practice whatever craft you decide, you cannot learn and grow as a, as a writer or an actor or anything, unless you're practicing your craft. It's all very well to sit and write your plays alone, you know, but you have to uh, practice. And Taranj gave me the platform to really find my voice and to really plug into that. And later, so really, it was it was Golden Thread really uh, was a lifesaver. And then later Silk Road uh, uh, Rising uh, came along 
and there was more and more interest. So, sorry, you had a very specific question. I think I, I danced around it. No, actually, that is that is really uh, what I wanted to know. Um, I yeah, guess so, it yeah, has so, to do with it has to do with not only the lack of representation that you were encountering, but also what you came from. In other yes. words, what we come from influences our storytelling. Yes, yes, and it was weird. It's, and I'll finish right now because so we can move on. But it's just it's it's. Uh, you know, it's like when you find your voice, you look back and realize how invisible you were rendered for so long. And then it just, things just come pouring out. And um, so, yeah, it was a, it, uh, yeah, thank God for Golden Thread. No kidding. No kidding. Hadi, what can you add to that? Um, interesting. I had a, a similar different journey, right? Um, I came here when I was 20. And so I came as an adult. I was born and raised in Beirut. I'm from Lebanon. And so um, it took me 15 years to realize I'm an immigrant and not an Arab American and to realize that it's such a different experience because I was not here at nine, after 9-11. I did not experience a shift in identity. And so I was kind of born and raised in the old world with the language and with with uh, with uh, it's 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 pretty different. And so I think to answer your question, Catherine, if um about that relationship between where we're from and the theater. Um, I'm discovering how much my relationship to storytelling here is based on being an immigrant in the sense that I find that I'm uh, the Arab American stories tell me a story that isn't mine and I love to see it. And then I feel that like I tell a story that is not necessarily one that Arab Americans have access to. And um, I think I think that, you know, that kind of richness in what we do, you know, stories by immigrants, stories by people who came here when they were four, stories by people who came here when, who were born here is very interesting. And it's, um, and it's also, I think also with the, with, with, with the incredible um, speed of technology and also like kind of the world becoming kind of one and not really, uh, like, I feel like there's a lot of international there's the 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 conversation with this stories internationally is becoming a bit more fluid and quicker um but uh so that's on like kind of the on, on a macro level on, on a micro level in terms of storytelling i think um you know Catherine and i talk a lot about that which is i i was never i never had a need to affirm my identity in the sense that against like the white kind of american you know, um, uh, kind of erasing narrative that a lot of Arab Americans have experienced because they were born and raised here. I kind of ran away from mine. And so it's very interesting to be here as a storyteller and 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 kind of I, I think I'm also interested in the ugliness of of where we come from sometimes and and also the beauty. And so I think I find myself writing about that ugliness and writing about that beauty. Um, and I find myself having conversations with non-Americans, Arab Americans, and immigrants, as well as people who never left. So it's yeah. that kind of, you know, I yeah. think it's there. And, you know, I just want to point out one thing that I know about your work um, is that you are definitely writing from a different perspective than perhaps Denma would or another writer who was born and raised in the United States. However, you definitely address the intersection of the culture you come from and the one you're in now. And maybe there'll be a moment in, the, in a few minutes when we could talk a little bit more about that because you have perspectives on those connections and those challenges that others of us don't necessarily have. Thank Jeff, you for that. Talk for a minute about, yeah, um, how you know your storytelling reflects your experience of being the child of immigrants, which I totally relate to. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I think in the process of writing and starting with family, it gave me the opportunity to understand more of what that means. Like in, in my experience and also being raised by a single mother, you know, that there is this really <laughs> strong sense of duality of switching. And, you know, they switch to be sort of like a, a part of the American mainstream and then they switch back 
to sort of be at home and that you grow up as a kid learning that your parent has masks and you get to understand them you know like in a, in a lot of ways I didn't really understand what that was as a kid it was sort of like why is it my mom the same all the time why is it my dad the same all the time and then I realized oh America that there is a construct here and they don't belong and so they are literally always pitching they are always pitching. And I think especially during my mom's time, which was the 70s and 80s in Manhattan, that, that, that there was this other layer of being sort of like, you know, you know, she was, you know, fetishized as a, as a woman, a young woman, and also work, a, you know, a financial person in Manhattan. So there was this really sort of sense that she didn't really fit in any of the spheres. And I think, you know, it, it's interesting, like for me, I've never outwardly been a political person. And yet when I started writing and really sort of centering in on some of the questions I had for myself, I found that um, so much of it had to do with the Arab identity in America and it's sort of erasure as Hedy, you were sort of saying that is such a big part of it or or at least for like the Middle Eastern identity to be able to blend. And, you know, like my brother and I didn't learn Arabic on purpose in order to blend. And yet, you know, all of my family lives in Cairo. So we really don't have anyone here. And so as a kid, there was this sense of going back and forth to Cairo as a kid. You know, we we live near the pyramids. We also live um, you know, by the by the sea. And so we I had this like extreme experience of like going, it felt back in time. And then also coming to this, uh, you know, to living in like Princeton, New Jersey, <laughs> where it was like a really sort of elite situation. And, you know, for he, you know, I would say I learned that in America, the religion is money. In Egypt, the religion is, you know, something, um, you know, ancient and holy, and it's part of, you know, Islam. And so there was this really, in the very beginning, I was sort of trying to figure out what are these different values. In America, the value is individuality. In Egypt, this real sense of community beyond connection, actually, like we have each other, we have each other, you know, so I, I've been fascinated by someone as a child of that being sort of straddling these two worlds, and really feeling that um, sort of a fluency, I guess, on being outside and inside both. Mm -hmm. Yusuf, do you feel that you are straddling two worlds or did you, or have you along the way? You're on mute. Yusuf, you're muted. You know, sometimes I'm muted. Sometimes I'm unmuted and you're listening to me, listening to cat videos. You know, it's just one of those days. So um, yes, no, well, uh, you know, I'm sort of straddling three worlds because I, uh, you know, when Nasser came along, he nationalized a bunch of companies and including my father's. And so we had to, we moved to England to start again. And I was there really, I mean, I I went back to, when I was 18, we, I left, I was, I was in England when I was three, went back when I was 18, back to Cairo and did my undergraduate degree at the American University in Cairo and then came for my graduate studies here uh, in the States. And so, and then somewhere in the mid eighties, I had to decide, well, do I want to go back to England and kind of uh, pick up where I left off or, you know, and I sort of chose the road less traveled. So it's really three cultures that I'm, I'm dealing with. And actually, given that my formative years were spent in England, uh, you know, there's this weird thing in my, where the sensibility is a sort of slight English sensibility. And sometimes I have to explain the tone and sensibility, even though it took me about five, six years to be able to write American characters without hearing British, you know, of just, you know, occasionally a little Brit Britishism, little, you know, will a, a, a Brit saying or something will pop up and somebody will correct me. So that's weird. Um, and, um, but uh, yeah, so there is a lot of straddling, a lot of straddling, uh, straddling of cultures. And, you know, we go back after I got my green card, went and after Nasser uh, left uh, family, a lot of family moved back and I would go back every year for at least a month. Um, so yes, yes, and and you're right. I mean, in Egypt. Anyway, that's another subject. But um, 
and I do envy, sometimes I envy people who were just born and raised in one country. I envy them for the ease with which uh, they, uh, language, you know, that, uh, you know, I have adopted a language and I have adopted a sensibility, the American sensibility. I've adopted the American language. I had to learn that. I had to learn how, you know, people speak. And so I kind of envy, I can kind of hear the difference with some playwrights where they're kind of swimming in the language where I'm kind of, you know, I'm sort of, I, I'm in a different flow and um, sort of negotiating with the language a little bit. That so is so interesting, yes. Well, the first time I met you, Yusuf, I was just sort of taken aback by your accent, which actually is not as strong as it was 10 years ago. If oh, I good. Met you. Yep, good. well, I don't know if that's good or bad. Fine, I'm, I'm hoping by my 80s, I will have yeah. really, my American accent will have just, you know, boop. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Sure my, my, I want to ask one more question of y'all before we uh, bring the students in, because I'm eager to hear their questions. But I think one of the things that's been sort of <clears throat> running around in my mind is um, what the response is to these stories that you are compelled to tell. What uh, and I don't just mean audience responses, although that's interesting too, but responses from the community, responses from your collaborators, uh, whoever, whichever director you're working with, the actors. I'm just curious uh, what you run into, good and bad, or hard and easy, uh, when you are working on a new play that is coming from a pretty personal place for you. Yusuf, you're, you're not on mute now, so I'd like you to just start. Oh, okay. Um, you know, what am I? What is the reaction of the people I collaborate with plays? I mean, it's, you know, over the years, it's it's the relationship um, I've had. You know, it in the very beginning, as a, an Arab American friend of mine said, you know, Yusuf, the problem is you're writing plays for actors who don't yet exist. So what was happening in the early two thousands were. Uh, actors who were not of Middle Eastern descent acting these roles. And so there was a lot of explanation and a lot of, you know, um, um, uh, trying to plug them in. Um, and there's still, it's still, you know, we, st uh, uh, what's, uh, I have 3,000 points. Um, and, you know, even still today, there's, the, I was in the, uh, was a, a production within the last five years, won't name it. But you know, the, what the costume designer was not of Middle Eastern descent, and they were they were just offering things. I was going, no, you know, or or that's not it. That's sort of Moroccan. That's not Egyptian. Mm -hmm. um, or um, you know, the assumption that the woman would be veiled. I'm going, well, no, not not necessarily. They wouldn't necessarily be veiled. And so sometimes as you're in explanation mode. And then sometimes you do collaborate. And I, I love the fact when I can collaborate with non-Middle Eastern people because as well, because then you're kind of, everybody's gathering to investigate a culture and it's it's a wonderful exploration for everyone. Everyone's going on an adventure. So I love that too. But sometimes if you get just the right actor who understands those mannerisms, who understands where I'm coming from with the character, it's a relief. Of course, definitely. Patty, what, what's been your experience? Uh, participants to unmute themselves. Sorry. Yeah. Um, everyone thinks I'm a genius. That's my experience. Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, well, basically, look, uh, my experience is interesting in the sense that um, uh, I think when when we, I think the, the thing that I get is, oh, this is an interesting angle on what we're doing here in the States. That's what I kind of get, which makes me very happy because I think I'm trying to do that to kind of look at the U.S. from the outside, uh, from uh, from 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 our perspective. Because, I mean, I have been an audience member a lot of times in the states, and the amount of times Americans of all kinds write about the, you know, uh, foreign characters is staggering, and it, it's it's interesting for me right now to kind of do the opposite. And see the language and see the the music. I write a lot based on music, and to see like a lot of that, 
to see all that, to see the politics uh, from kind of a global perspective, and I think it resonates in the room. Um, uh, so, so that's maybe the most common uh, reaction that I get. Um, uh, it's it's usually one of, oh, I feel like I was taken to Beirut or I was taken to the Middle East, which is really, really great, you know, because of the sounds and the smells and all the sensory things that, and, and to your point, Yusuf, I mean, I, I'm having a similar problem right now, which is um, there aren't a lot of actors that I know, and please, if you know them, please introduce me to them, who are, uh, who speak and live Arabic uh, and, and work in the US, right? Like there are tremendous actors here, but then, you know, the language is not there. And it's, you know, and it's it's when you write bilingually for, you know, it's sometimes hard to find those actors even now. And, you know, like, especially if an older generation, because like, you know, mm -hmm. I know so many Arabic speaking 28 year olds who are working and are fantastic actors. But then when you go up the age, I meet the the, the, the scarcity that you're talking about in the early 2000s, when I'm looking for someone who's a bit older, who let's say can do a flawless Iraqi accent. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's one of those things. So I think that's what I, I don't know. I answered the question. I did. That answer. is well. That is so interesting, Hadi, uh, to me personally because it inspires me. You know how my mind works, and it inspires me to think about how we can bring more um, Arabic-speaking actors, wonderful actors of a certain age, together with writers who you see, you see where I'm going with this, right? Hundred percent. I know you're always so going to program. Work out. You're always starting something that will solve something, which I love about you. But also the other thing is you've done a lot of international work and there, these actors obviously exist in the Middle East, but then you, but then there's the problem of visas and oh, yes. oh, yes. them and money. And so it's like, you know, again. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, Denmo, um, just uh, going over to you and I'm wondering what your experience, I mean, you've been a part of Golden Thread for a while now and, uh, and you've been surrounded by um, writers and actors and directors from the community. And I'm wondering, you know, what has been your experience from collaborators, from local audiences, uh, et cetera, from people in the community um, to the themes and, uh, and, and the stories that you tell? Unmute, Denma. All right, great, there you are. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's been, it's been really a journey. I mean, my first piece for Baba was about Muhammad, who is like immigrant, immigrant all the way, you know? Um, and um, the, so the sense of like, this is not, you don't, you, you, this, this guy is not your everyday Joe, was sort of really front and center. And um, I think one of the things that's successful about that piece is very soon, you know, the accent, um, the sort of like uh, immigrant uh, persona archetype is transcended. And we're like, oh no, actually this is my dad. This is my friend. I know this guy, this guy is me. And um, in my, you know, my last piece, um, um, you know, that was sort of centered around, oh, Arab Spring, you know, mm -hmm. where it was sort of centered around um, uh, a brother or sister dealing with a funeral, you know, their brother sister relationship is first and their sort of cultural baggage is sort of second. And I think that that really resonates with people because they're like, I have a brother, I have a sister, I have a family. And, and you know, I, I think people come to the theater with Mina in particular and think there's going to be a whole lot of political stuff and point of views and teaching about religion or something like that. Like it's going to be, you know, some kind of like political message. And what, you know, in, in my work, just because I'm not really coming at it at that lens, I, I, 
I think there is a real sort of sense of like warmth and love for what people don't even realize that they've othered, you know, that they've distanced from um, and that that really melts. I mean, we, you know, in San Francisco where I was based for 18 years, you know, many people would say they're very liberal and open, et cetera. And then, you know, you kind of discover I think sometimes when you're watching um, a play with a character like Muhammad in Baba, that there's a real sort of, uh, th there are still even the most liberal of us have our judgments and biases. Of course, we're human, why wouldn't we? So there's no problem with that. But I think I think some of the feedback I've received is, is how, how we use the sort of um, the culture or the religion or the sense of like the immigrant, the outsider as a medium to connect with the parts of us that we've also ostracized. And, and isn't like, that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the money right there. That's yeah. like why we go to the theater. That's why absolutely. artists are doing the thing, you know? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just gonna pause now uh, just to say, first of all, I wanna uh, put out a reminder for those uh, you know, tuning in now that um, who we are and what we're doing here today, which is we're in conversation um, and no summary golden thread online conversation with artists who don't fit in a box. And we are here uh, in conversation with playwrights Yusuf El Gindi, Denmo Ibrahim, and Hadi Tabal. Um, and um, I, at this point, I would really like to invite questions from the students at Cal Poly and University of Washington. So, um, Hala and Munna, if you can perhaps, uh, you know, let us know which of your students have a particular question they'd like to ask either of all the panelists or of one in particular. Yes, sure, but I think I will leave the room a little bit for Hala, the students uh, want to be uh, at a certain moment. Hala, would you like to start by your student? Sure, thank you so much, Mona. Um, yeah, we do have one question here. Baxter, take it away. Hello, uh, my name is Baxter. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering major. And then uh, I have a question for Hattie Tabal about the remnants. Uh, so I just finished this, that play this weekend and I really loved the, uh, the intellectual discussions that were weaved in about uh, like the makers of history versus the participants of history and like whether there's a right or a wrong in the moment. And I also really loved how you weaved in uh, the artist um, Alm Kathum and the song Alec Paul. And I was wondering what your inspiration was for weaving that, making that such an integral part of that play. Well, thank you for reading the play, first of all, and for, you know, reading it so so deeply, uh, uh, um, and thank you for your question. Um, I think uh, it's funny sometimes, <laughs> you know, the theater takes 5,000 years to, you know, to be made. I started writing this play six, six millennia ago. And, um, and, and there, there are, you know, you kind of forget what made you write something. I mean, you just make me think about it. But there's some, I think the main drive of that piece has been, um, I experienced something when I listened to Um Kulthum, right? I experienced something that is extremely hard to communicate. And because uh, I would imagine an American listening to a very American thing would have a lot of trouble explaining that to someone who's not, right? I mean, I experienced a lot when I listened to Whitney Houston. That's my American side, right? And it's, it's but I can explain that to an American, but I can't explain Um Kulthum in a lot of ways. And I think there's something about getting to know someone when you hear their music or when you hear what when you hear what they listen to and how they listen to it. And Um Kulthum particularly is um, one a woman, not a man, who is known deeply by a culture of 300 to 400 million people. And she is also someone who 6 million people went to her funeral right? Actually more than Nasser. So she is a figure in our culture that is deeply understood by, in our DNA. And when I wanted to write that play, I, the, 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 the political side of the play was what happened in Abu Ghraib in 2003, 2004, 
when you had American soldiers who were completely untrained to do what they were supposed to do, but then were given directives very clearly to do what they were not supposed to do, and were uh, committed atrocities uh, in, in the prison outside of Baghdad um, that are unimaginable. And so for me, I wondered what it would be like if these Americans heard our music. And I wondered what it would be like if we were put in a situation that was different. Would these people have done that to each other the way they did in this play or in reality? So for me, weaving the music is basically asking the question of the what if question. You hear someone else's music or you fail to. Thank you. Wow. Very interesting. question. What, what else? Uh, from either class. Go ahead and jump in, Mona, while we brainstorm. Thank you. I think Clau has a question directly related to uh, uh, Hadi's uh, final say. So please go ahead, Clau. Would you like to be asked a question? Uh, oh, sorry. I hope you I hope can hear me. Okay, sorry. I hope, you, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my question is, my name is Carl, by the way. Love. Uh, my question is basically, basically for Mr. Hadi Tabao. I really enjoy The Remnants. I think it's my, one of my favorite plays so far. I was wondering about the subject of addressing foreign audience when you're writing about something culturally specific, especially controversial subjects like military intervention. How, how, what, what research and consideration do you put in when you want to address this subject to foreign audience who may not be able to relate to it? Thank you. I, I think I'll rephrase your question in case others didn't hear it because I think you wrote it in the chat. So I, ha I had a, you know, um, you're asking what kind of research do you do about things that you're going to present to an audience that might not know about, right? And so how do you approach that? Is that right in a way? Well, uh, it's a very good question because one one of the things that I think I'm sure, you know, Demo and, and Yusuf and yourself probably in the same situation is you're writing and suddenly you go, um, who am I writing this for? Am I writing this for Lebanese people? Am I writing this for Americans? You know, and I, I catch myself not knowing my audience sometimes. And so your question is really intelligent. It's a very complicated process because... Uh, I, I guess the more I write, the more experience I get, the more I know my audience and how I want to present my work to my audience. But uh, there are two things happening, right? On the one hand, you want to write what you know and not compromise. And on the other hand, you want to write what you know, but be able to access the audience. So in a way, you kind of have to do the research and you kind of have to put in the play, and this is this is difficult, so that you don't get expositional, so that you don't get kind of you know bogged down by the the thing that we all as you know um, uh, BIPOC artists are always bogged down by, which is explaining the basics of the thing you're talking about because no one knows it, you know. So you kind of have to be smart about when you put in the data, the information that allows people who don't know about the, your world to latch onto it, right? And also, you kind of have to have the courage to say, listen, these people might not know about Iraq, might not know about Uncle Thum, might not know about enhanced interrogation techniques that were clearly sanctioned by the U.S. government and written specifically in documents on how to torture people. But if you put what you need to put there and then you trust the things that they don't know that might be interesting to them, at least emotionally, you kind of find that balance. Do you know what I mean? Because you don't want to also write a piece that is so didactic as if you're talking down to your audience, assuming they don't know. You also want to assume your audience knows. And at the end of the day, we write plays to make people feel something or learn something intellectually and or emotionally. So the intellectual side of the writing is only there to serve that experience of watching characters go through something. And eventually you're going to write something universal. So even if the world is not necessarily that, uh, the, the, the audience doesn't know about it, what they will know about is what the characters are going through or else you're not really doing your job. Wow, good question. Thank you so much for that. Um, listen, before we, I go to the chat because there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Hala, I think your class needs to end it, um, at the hour. So anybody else have a particular question? 
We have a second question from Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Um, okay, this time my question is for Denma Ibrahim. Um, so I also read your play, Baba, this weekend, and I really loved how you created like a sense of waiting in both acts of the play. And like, unlike waiting for Godot, like there were like major character developments with like, um, like major ending for stuff did, important stuff did happen. And so I think like, especially like your ending of the second act where Layla and her husband, oh, sorry, Layla and her father uh, reunite in Egypt uh, was very heartwarming and touching. And I was really curious because you mentioned how the play can either be like a one, one person show or a two person show. And I wanted to know a little bit more about how you would do that scene as a one person show then. Cause I'm always curious about how theater makers envision uh, various scenes like that. <laughs> Well, uh, it's a very good question. And I would probably, you know, bunt that to the director <laughs> to figure out. Um, but I think the way it's written right now is it feels like, um, it feels like a sort of opportunity available for the two-hander, but in a solo show, really depending on the tone and feel of it, because there is this moment midway where the transition happens. And originally I played the role, I wrote it and then I performed it. And the transition was, it took me years to figure out how do I go from literally having um, a fat suit, a mustache and a wig and these glasses with this huge costume to changing into this woman on stage. So the transition moment plays with Muhammad, the actor, the actor becoming Layla, Layla. And it's sort of this gorgeous moment where we're out of the play and in the play and like um, the audience is with you in that, it's maybe 30 seconds. And I mention it because I think in the solo show, there could be an opportunity of hinting at that sort of duality at the end. So instead of it necessarily just being Layla playing it straight, how she would with Muhammad sort of echoed in the back, it could be Layla. In, in essence, we wanna see all of those people at the end. So I think your question is great and I'd love to see that. Thank you, Denmo. Again, Thank you. Know, and, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm in the chat now, and I'm seeing a question from Jean-Marc Azar. And um, I don't know if Jean-Marc is a, one of the students or is joining us uh, from someplace else. But uh, the question is interesting. And uh, it, it, he specifically is um, uh, put it in for Denmo. But I, I'm wondering you know, uh, if uh, the others, Hadi and Yusuf, might want to comment as well. Uh, he wrote, Denmo Ibrahim, theater often provides a platform for social commentary and activism. Are there any specific social issues or narratives that you feel strongly about and strive to address through your work? I mean, I completely agree. Um, and I think it depends on when. I think that that you can't answer that in sort of as a, you know, fill in the blank. Um, you know, initially, I think the issue when Baba was written and performed at that time, and also it just had a, a, a production at Amphibian Stage a few months ago, you know, the commentary there, I think, was really around uh, what happens to the first and second generation, the sort of, like, like right now, the conversation, I think, in the MENA community, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, in my mind, top of mind, is that the MENA identity is not on the census. We are not legally represented in America. We don't exist. And, and that's a big friggin' deal, you know, in terms of representation, funding. Um, and at the same time, our community in particular is incredibly surveilled. There's a lot of surveillance, there's a lot of hate crimes, and yet we don't have any kind of protection or representation. So to me, that's a huge thing right now. So so when when any when any Mina play gets on stage, it feels like it's shedding light on a community that we are ignoring on purpose. That's one. And two, I think there is something around, um, you know, 
being able like like the, the idea of being silenced you know um right now the middle if you're if you are middle eastern and you're on the census you must identify as white which i think is just a really interesting thing that we need to unpack so I, that's my relationship right now with a lot of the work that i want to produce and continue to explore very interesting and yusuf i think i know the answer to this but are there any political or social issues that uh, you feel you can and should and do address in your work? Um, you know, I, I'm never agenda driven when I write a play. It's always uh, um, emanates from characters who are bubbling up and want to chatter away. And um, so the political aspect of it, the activism comes naturally through the uh, drama of these people's lives. I think I think to the notion of the personal and political uh, that they're separate is a kind of a, um, I, I think if you can separate them, you're in a privileged position. I think for a lot of people, they're, you know, around in Egypt, when I go and chat, the chatter is political. You know, domestic is political, where we're chatting about um, politics and it goes seamlessly from what's happening in the family to what's happening you know uh politically to you know my family's politically engaged and so the domestic and the political it occupies the same sphere i mean we moved you know our personal trajectory my family uh was uh um due to political actions taken and my father had to respond and you know we used to joke that uh whoever was in power one half of the family was in prison and the other half was you know uh doing well with that regime so it's um you know so the activism the notion of uh, and some of the criticism of my work sometimes was always being you know didactic or it's being this or that and i think it's it, it, almost just the very uh the, the temerity to bring something up you know um was regarded as well uh, why are you trying to address the social forces you know that affect us all which is weird and there are a lot of playwrights especially also the British sensibility that I grew up with it's of course the individual is part is interwoven into the social fabric and the, the political fabric and you are going to in talking about the individual you are talking about them uh, politically as well mm -hmm. and, and it's not an either or so social activism is not a now I'm going to talk about this issue. I'm going to talk about uh, these characters and naturally, organically, political uh, issues are going to arise and affect. Indeed, indeed. And uh, there's a question here from Rosa Peterson at University of Washington. And, um, and for Denmo's Baba and Yusuf Stamp Me, how did you no, you wanted the play to only include one actor. And Denmo, well, you've kind of talked about that a little bit already, but Yusuf, what about Stab Me? Why is that only from the the one character, the one person's perspective? I'm wondering. Well, Stab Me is, you know, it's a monologue. It's just a seven page, uh, 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 I don't know how many pages monologue, but we'll just kind of pour it out in one go, which is, uh, and it was really just, you know, um, talking about the you know domestic uh, intersecting with the political it's um yeah it, it, it's about somebody uh moving along in the immigration line to get to the immigration officer who's going to either let them in or you know cause trouble or please step aside and it's all the tension which i feel to this day whenever i approach a you know even now that i have an american passport um, you know, that I feel whenever I, 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 I come to, and this character does not have an American passport and is trying to get into the States, mm -hmm. and is we're hearing his internal monologue as yeah. he snakes his way towards the uh, immigration officer who will look at his passport and determine his life, determine the rest of his life, you know, that power. And, um, and just the... And the, the the helplessness, the rage, the uh, um, the internal conversations. It's like when I travel, two, three months before I'm traveling, I'm having conversations with whatever immigration person I'm going to. If I'm going to England, I'm having conversations with the 
you know, internally, they start, you know. And if I'm coming back to, I'm having conversations, you know, wherever I'm having, you know, uh, wherever I'm going. So that's where that play came from. And it's really, you know, it's border crossing, crossing international borders. Mm. Uh, I remember when the lark kept saying, oh, we'll send you here, we'll send you there. And I was, and I was, I, I was resisting, you know, if I think I said, well, because if you grow up with an American passport, you have no idea, no idea the privilege you have to travel, to cross borders, to get into countries. This, for most people around the country and in Egypt, the notion of getting a visa, that the humiliating hoops you have to jump through to get a, a visa to travel anywhere. I mean, you probably won't. You probably won't get it. And it is, it, and to get it, you have to provide documents. And so the notion of travel, that just traveler is, is uh, for most people around the world, it's very, very difficult. And so that's where that stamp me comes from. Yeah, got it. You know, um, here's a, another question. Um, for, uh, Denmo talked about, it's from Kyler Simons. Uh, Denmo talked about individuality in the United States and how much it is valued here, while on the contrary, Egypt has, as you said, that strong sense of community. And do any of you feel a sense of community while working in the States with other people of Middle Eastern origin? How does it make you feel having this growing community while also harnessing your own individu individuality? And I'm so glad that question was put in the chat because it was actually something I wanted to ask all of you, which was what it feels like to be an artist in the community, having your own very strong voice, all of you, um, but um, you know, being part of a, uh, a growing, a burgeoning uh, group in the United States. Um, Started, so, you know, how do you, how do you, how, what's that like connecting with the other people in the community? You know, it's it's truly, I mean, to use a dumb word, it's great in the sense that like you, there's this like, um, like 12 years ago, right? I definitely felt more alone in terms of making theater than I do now, right? Like right now I feel Golden Thread is my community and newer theater is my community and the people I do plays with that I did last year, I happened to do three plays, you know, two are Middle Eastern and like, you know, are my community and just... I mean, that's, you know, the Middle Eastern right, the, the Middle Eastern Writers Lab at the Lark, which is now at Playwrights Horizons, is there are all these, and some of them became very good friends. And so I think it's a very different game when you are not, you don't have a community. And at the same time, it is important to remember that being part of a community is not, does not mean that you erase your individuality and you have to keep fighting also for the for your community and for people outside your community to still see ourselves as individual artists with individual voices and um and that's and it's also very interesting to to i think we it it's great to be part of a community that i mean just that meeting we did at playwrights horizons last week or two weeks ago was kind of about how we can all be so diverse within the community so that's you know it all feels very good because also when you want your work produced or you want to do readings of it or when you want to find actors or there are people helping you you're not just there talking to like you know the artistic director of this place and that place and you're sitting there and you're starting from zero there is already you know groundwork that's been covered and that's what a community does you know so that does feel great yeah okay yeah who else would like to speak to that yusuf uh, yes, I, I, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm back when all this kind of started, um, uh, you know, it was in the late 90s, uh, 97 with Golden Thread and just more and more in the brass in New York and there was a couple of other outlets and there was also a literary uh, 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 magazine, Misner from Minneapolis and things were bubbling up in the late 90s and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Finally. Oh, my God, finally. The 9-11 happened and I remember thinking, oh no, I hope this all doesn't get, you know, silenced, that we don't all go, you know, uh, we can no longer, 
you know, this wonderful renaissance that is happening. Um, but luckily, you know, um, as happens when a group of people in this country uh, suddenly be, have this negative spotlight uh, put on them, uh, they are forced to respond. And so the the artists, the poets, the play, you know, the playwrights, comedians, actors start stepping up and and needing to respond. It's sort of uh, most groups go through this. So um, so it's lovely. So it's lovely to have gone from the early two thousands where we were sort of like gathering the tribe, so to speak, all the disparate. Uh, people from the different uh, uh, MENA communities, and to this point where it's just burgeoning, and it's so wonderful, all these writers coming up, and and now we have actors and, uh, and directors, and there are some theaters who are more interested. So it's lovely to see this growth. And for, you know, now the larger community, the theater community goes, oh, this is a body of work and a body of people that, perhaps we now need to pay attention to where before we could be ignored because we were one or two people, you know, and now it's, we are, uh, get, we are gathered. Exactly. Exactly. Denmo, any, any thoughts from your experience? I, think, I, I would just say, I, I still feel it's fairly nascent. You know, the Manatma has just recently been formed Mina theater makers Alliance. We've had um, three or four convenings. So the sense of like community, it feels more like, I know this person, I know this person, we gather in these small ways, but in terms of like a national organization, it still feels fairly young. And, um, and so, I, I think as a community, and, and I mean on a national level, on a regional level even, I think we're still trying to find how do we find each other and how do we get in the same room together and what do we talk about? And we have a lot of you know differences. Um, I think for me, the, the sort of community really comes alive once the show is set and you're in a room. And you know you have actors and directors and designers and the playwright and you know you're all working towards this like goal of this production and in that way it's sort of like a microcosm you know that's where it feels like community really thrives and everyone might not even be Mina but it has a Mina focus um, so that feels really powerful I, so I have a lot of hope. Um, that will create more opportunities for these like small communities to continue to grow as we find a way to make these like larger bridges more accessible and often. Inshallah. Yeah, great. Beautiful. Um, so, um, Hala, uh, Muna, um, uh, are there any other questions that your students would like to ask? Uh, yes, actually, Kyler, you already asked the question. I think uh, Chloe's question related to the idea of what strength does more drama offer uh, in terms of advocacy issues of mobility and identity representation. Um, and this question is addressed to and to Denmo. Um, so, yeah. Um, is that question in the chat as well? Yes, it is in the chat uh, as well. So, you know, the sound for me was, um, uh, uh, the, yeah, the sound is a bit, could you could you repeat that? Or Catherine, could you, could you summarize the? Uh, no, because I had the same problem. That's why I was trying to find it in the, in the chat. The, the, the sound quality, uh, Mona was a bit. Okay, I'm gonna move oh, right here. Do you hear me better? Yes, 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 yes. Good, good, yes. good. So, uh, uh, the question of Chloe. Chloe, raise your hand. Hi, Chloe. So, Chloe's question relates to the idea of what does monodrama offer? Uh, what oh. strength does monodrama offer in addressing issues of identity representation and specifically mobility? And uh, stamp me and. Um, Okay. Right. Demo. Oh, oh. What does what does the 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 strength of monodrama offer? Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Well, before I tell you about the strength, can I tell you about the challenge? <laughs> so the challenge of a monodrama is you have to have an incredible actor. Mm -hmm. You must because it is very challenging to watch one person for more than seven minutes. We just need something else, you know? And so it requires, it, it, it really requires an actor who can live and thrive and create incredible nuance without other actors. Given that, 
if you can have that, if you can find that, a solo show has an opera, it has a way of focusing in like a, a lens in a way that a product that then a multi-character show doesn't have. You know, you, you as an audience member can pop from person to person and sort of figure out the story, but it sort of feels like a microcosm in on a large scale. Um, and I also think it's like very theatrical actually, because we're not in these, you know, we don't live in vacuums, right? So to see a solo work really requires a lot of imagination and theatricality to make it feel alive. So it's not a perfect form and in, a, you know, in that way. And because of that, I think it has a lot of opportunity to sort of excite, entice, subvert your ideas of what the play is gonna be. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think I think so that's much, Cal Poly class. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Baxter. Good to see you again. Hello. <laughs> Hi. What were you going to say, Yusuf? No, I was just going to reiterate. Uh, I was going to demos points. Yes, the, the focus, you know, that's, you better have a really good actor who can just play all the instruments, so to speak. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I, and when I do write solo pieces, they're usually short, like Stamp Me is like seven pages, um, six pages, one or, one or the other. And um, it's, um, what do I like about them? I mean, I, I must admit the, you know, my agent, uh, agents over the years have gone, um, you know, do you have like smaller casts? And I said, well, I have three, I have a three person play. There was a, do you have a two person play? I said, well, let me write a two person play. And then it's, do you have a one person? I'm going, what, what, what do you want? What, what, what is this? It's like, so uh, sometimes I did write a full length one person uh, uh, mm -hmm. play collaborator. And I, I was thinking, oh, thank God. I, I, I have a, you know, uh, something for my agent. I have a one person play. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean it is challenging. I mean, with with, with shorter with a shorter piece, you can you can um, uh, you can get away with a lot. But if you if it's a one person full length, then you better have, you know, uh, that actor better fill the room, and right. better, you know, um, because as Demo said, you know, uh, that's that's all you've got, and they're telling the story. Um, uh, yeah. I, I uh, thank you for that. I have one final question that I would like to just throw out to all three of you. And, you know, it's, it's all right. You, you have to forgive me. This is based on personal inclinations of mine, but um, I'm so, I am so eager to interface with um, our counterparts in our cultures of origin. Okay. Who are born and raised in the United States, but very, very connected to Lebanon and so excited when I have the opportunity to collaborate with people over there. And I, I, I just you know, wanna throw out that <clears throat> in, in some of the work of yours that I have read <clears throat> and Hadi in your recent work, especially I'm so taken with the um, demands of the plays regarding language, regarding sensibility, uh, everything from understanding of the environment to understanding of the food. I mean, and I just, you know, wanted to throw out and ask, you know, what is your interest um, or inclination to, to work with people on the other side to realize some of your work? I'm curious about it. It would be a dream, to be honest. Um, I visit Beirut often, especially that now I have a child and uh, to see my parents. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I've never really worked in the Middle East as an adult in Lebanon, uh, but I've been back and forth. And now I'm meeting some people actually some, sometimes through Catherine. Uh, and um, there is something thrilling when you meet someone who can be the dream dramaturg on your piece or an actor who is basically the person you're looking for to play the Lebanese or the Syrian in your play. They speak the language, they have the mannerisms, they know, they, they understand 
you know, they understand that guy or that woman that you're writing or whatever, you know, the character. It's just, I, I don't, it's so hard in terms of financially and also in terms of um, uh, politically, in terms of visas and mobility and all these things. I don't know, like, I wish there was, I would love, there my Beirut series, I would love to do those plays in New York and in Beirut. They all take place between both cities. And to have actors from both cities do those pieces, it would be a dream. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, uh, I think also like nowadays, like, I think we need to start thinking on the at this level because at a certain point you go to the theater in the states you go to the plays and you go and you go and you go and it's like there's a whole world out there mm -hmm. like there's a world of people who speak different languages mm -hmm. have different sensibilities yeah. live in different cities do different kinds of theater and it's it feels a bit like you start feeling a bit the drudgery of it so i think we owe it to ourselves to be international you know i agree completely as you know it's my life's work and i i yeah. You know, people have asked me, like, why are you so dedicated to these exchanges? And um, and uh, and, I, and I have to say that it makes me sad that a lot of global exchange programs have are biting the dust because I can't help but feel that the American theater, if it is not part of the global conversation, is going to get left in the dust. That's sort of, that's sort of my my worry, my concern. Um, anybody else want to um, comment on that? I mean, I think I think the the limitations are real in terms of an international thing. It almost feels like, can we just have some representation? Can we please just be a part of the season, please? And not make it really harder to also have in a character that's speaking Arabic and French and English. There's no way. I mean, I, I wrote a piece like that. I found an Egyptian man. It was the first time I could ever have a real Egyptian man in the role where English was their second language. And it was so powerful, but that feels like the exception. And so, you know, I just sort of feel like in terms of priority, how, how do we how do we create those relationships while we still develop the presence so that when the when it's time to make that sort of a, a main stage production, then we have developed that time and that sort of relationship, you know, because I, I do think um that those that really that 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 sort of dynamic is going to lend itself incredibly powerful to certain stories for sure and and to your point Catherine I think if we're not having the conversation um with other you know countries and cities then it sort of feels like America becomes insular why theater um so yeah yep well, I agree I agree that to both both points made the bat Yes, international, there is a whole section of the world that's just not taken into consideration in terms and culturally. It's just absent in the uh, conversations we have about culture in this country. So yes, including that is important. But my um, focus and my interest is that of the immigrant. Uh, obviously, because I, you know, when I was three and really I have the immigrant experience. And so my interest is in promoting and giving a platform to Arab Americans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to include uh, uh, Egyptians and Lebanese and you know voices from those countries and let's bring them here and let people know that there are these other voices, but also that there are Arab Americans. I mean, we were talking about the census and how we're not, you know, so we have to be more vocal and we have to respect ourselves as Arab Americans, as immigrants, because, um, Unless we do, nobody else is going to pay attention to us. You know, when I'm in Egypt and I go, uh, go, you know, I'm Arab American or Jewish American. Well, there's no such thing. You know, it's like I have to go. No, no, no. There is a whole group of people here who have a voice, and it's shaped by the their immigrant experience. And you know, so there's a slight denigration and a slight dismissal of the Arab American, you know, from some of these uh, uh, other countries. In so my. Um, passion is to promote the MENA community in the States. You know. Brilliant. Perfect. I, I can't thank you all for your, for your candor. Honestly, beautiful. And, and we have come to the end of our conversation. So I, it's my um, honor to thank all of you, the panelists, the students, the professors, everybody, just amazing. I want to thank HowlRound for hosting the program. Um, and as a reminder, all the No Summary episodes are live on Golden Threads and HowlRound's websites. Um, thank you to Wendy Reyes, our live stream technician and hero, um, and to the rest of Golden Threads small 
but mighty team. Michelle, Sheila, Linda, Saluna, and Heather, and especially Executive Artistic Director Sahara Saf. A uh, big thank you to the audiences and the people who attended today. Um, just letting you know that coming up next at um, Golden Thread, the New Threads reading series with two plays commissioned by the company. One by Adam Ashraf al Said is inspired by the story of high profile Egyptian political prisoner, Allah Abdel Fattah, and one by Tariq Hamami, inspired by the experience of the Black Panthers in Algiers. And the Reorient Festival of Short Plays in the fall, which will feature the work of one of today's speakers, Yusuf al -Gindi. And for more info, of course, visit the Golden Thread website and join the email list, okay? So you stay on top of the programs and events. So with that, lots of love to everybody. Thank you and goodbye. Bye everyone. Demo, I love you so much. And I'm, I love we're getting together very soon. Yes, I love it.